events here, and I am very excited to welcome back our guest this evening. The writings of Donald Ray Pollock have been glowingly compared to the works of Cormac McCarthy, except this man has a sense of humor, a godless Flannery O'Connor, and a hopeful and vital Raymond Carver. But as Catherine Dunn said, Pollock is no shadow of anybody else. Knock 'em Stiff, his debut collection of stories, linked by their Southern Ohio setting, won the 2009 Penn Robert Bingham Prize, and the reviewer in the Washington Post of Pollock's first novel, The Devil All the Time, also set in Ohio, called the author a brilliant stylist and went on to say, the book is grotesque, violent, haunting, perverse, and harrowing, and very good. You may be repelled, you may be shocked, you will almost certainly be horrified, but you will read every last word. Pollock's latest Appalachian Gothic, The Heavenly Table, has been called his best work to date, particularly because of its technical prowess and contemplation of witty ideas of class and faith. I've just finished it, and I can tell you it's another ripping good yarn. This one features a band of brothers on the lamb as they follow in the footsteps of their fictional hero, Bloody Bill Bucket. Mr. Pollock will be interviewed by our own expert in all things Appalachian, my colleague and author of events and co-conspirator, Jason Freeman. Please welcome Donald Ray Pollock and Jason Freeman to the stage. Hi, everybody. Can uh, you all hear me? All right. Uh, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. I want to thank everybody at the Free Library for having me. Um, what I'm going to do is read maybe for about seven or eight minutes, and then we're going to have a little talk, and uh, then I'll answer your questions um, as best I can. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a little bit from Chapter 5, and I think the only thing you really need to know is that... Um, Pearl, who is uh, the Jewett brother's uh, father, uh, his wife died from an intestinal worm 10 years before. And he put the worm in a pillow. And he has slept with it, you know, all this time. And after his wife died, um, he lost the farm. And he and his sons have been wandering around trying to make a living ever since. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So here we go. <clears throat> After he lost his wife and the bank took the farm, Pearl and his sons wandered aimlessly like nomads across the harsh, impoverished South, still broken by a war that even he was too young to remember. They encountered corruption and decay at every turn, and their luck shifted from bad to worse. He prayed to God to smooth the way a bit, but no matter how hard they worked, their pockets remained empty, and the best the four of them could do was stay one step ahead of starvation. He couldn't understand it. Sitting by the fire in whatever meager camp they had made for the night, Pearl supped on parched corn and moldy bread and went back over his life, trying to recall something he might have done to deserve such a fate. He knew that he had sinned on occasion, yet no more than most, and certainly not as much as some. Pride had always been his biggest defect, and he knew that forcing Lucille to read those church lessons had been a vain and selfish act. But still, wasn't God supposed to forgive? If not for him, then at least for his sons? <clears throat> and so doubts began to creep into his mind, and that worried him even more than where their next meal was coming from. By the time Pearl met the hermit along the foggy river, Lucille had been gone 10 years, and the worm that killed her had turned to powder in his pillow. He was sitting on the bank in a daze that afternoon while the boys fished the water with their hands. They hadn't eaten anything in several days, but he didn't have the strength to help them. An occasional sparking sound that had started up in his head a few months ago had recently turned into an unrelenting sizzle as if his brains were being sauteed in a frying pan, and he hadn't slept more than a minute or two at a time in weeks. The man came out of the woods and sat down beside Pearl without a word, as if they had known each other for years. Suddenly aware of a presence, he roused himself and looked over, 
saw a bent and misshapen stranger carrying a rod made of ash and wearing nothing but a grimy torn sackcloth. On his forehead, a red canker the size of a silver dollar seethed like a hot coal. Pearl was reminded of a picture card he had once seen, of a heathen who had lived his entire life chained to a tree sitting in a pile of his own slops. His eyes turned to black bubbles from staring into the sun. He wondered if he was dreaming. Looks like you've been on the road a long time, he finally said to the man. The stranger nodded. See that little white bird over yonder in that cypress, he said, pointing with his rod. Shading his eyes with his hand, Pearl squinted across the river. Yeah, I seen. I've been following him for 50 years now. He takes me wherever I need to go. I had no idea a bird lived that long, Pearl said. Oh, that one will never die. How do you figure, said Pearl. Well, the hermit said, I've seen him blown to pieces with a four-gauge scatter gun and split in two by a panther's claws and even set on fire by a gang of no-goods over around Turlington a couple of years ago. And yet there he is, a sitting in that tree just as pretty as you please. He always comes back. Pearl thought for a minute, then asked, you some kind of preacher? The man shrugged his bony shoulders. God speaks to me from time to time, and his bird shows me the way. Not much else to it. Before he realized it, Pearl was telling the man about Lucille and the worm and all the ill fortune that had come after. He confessed that he was even beginning to wonder if God existed, for why would he treat some so badly and let others off the hook completely? It didn't add up. There was no way his paltry sins were equal to the tribulations that had befallen him and his family. After Pearl finished, the man sat quietly for a long time, stroking his matted beard. Then he glanced down at his calloused feet. He leaned over and began tugging on one of his big toenails with his knotty fingers. Without so much as a wince, he tore it off and held it up for Pearl to see. You got it all wrong, my friend, the man said. The truth is you've been chosen. God's given you the chance for a better resurrection, just like he did your old woman. Without taking hold of some of the misery in the world, there can't be no redemption, nor will there be any grace. That shouldn't come as no surprise if you study on it. Look what he let them Jews do to his own son. Most of us got it damned easy compared to the suffering that went on that day. But what they call preachers nowadays, they don't want to tell people the truth. Old Satan's tricked them into believing the way to salvation can be had for a little bit of nothing. Why, some of them even go around in their fancy clothes claiming that the Lord wants us all to be rich. How does such a man sleep at night, telling lies like that, using God to fatten his own pockets? Pure sacrilege, that's what it is. You wait and see. Those kind will burn the hottest come the judgment day. It's just a shame their flocks will end up roasting with them. No, you got to welcome all the suffering that comes your way if you want to be redeemed. You really believe that, Pearl said, staring down at the man's bloody toe while recalling the beaver hat and calfskin gloves the Reverend Hornsby back at the church in Hazelwood used to wear a bit too proudly. Friend, you and those boys of yours could drown me in that river right now, and it would be the most blessed thing ever happened to me. I don't know, Pearl said. I can see where sleeping out in the cold and going hungry from time to time might do a man some good, but mister, we're about starved clear out. The hermit smiled. I ain't ate nothing in over a week except a few tadpoles and the creatures I've found in this beard of mine. I wouldn't want no more than that. If that's so, Pearl said, what is it I get for all this redeeming you're talking about? Why, one day you'll get to eat at the heavenly table, the man said. Won't be no scrounging for scraps after that. I guarantee you. And I'm just going to let it go with that, okay? Thank you. I'm going to amend my first question, actually. Um, are there audio books for these, and do you read them? Uh, 
listen to them, you mean? <laughs> well, I mean, do you do you do the? Oh, do, do I do the? the no, I don't. Uh, okay. There are audio books for for all three of them, but I would certainly. I, I've never even listened that. to one of them actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I had brief bullet points on um, connecting this book to the other. I'm, I, I imagine a lot of people here tonight have read um, have read your other works. Um, and just as kind of a, a primer on that, violence, serial killing, lust, fervent religion, <laughs> violent religion, inexorable meetings, um, all the things you've, you've come to love um, in this work. Um, but there, there's, the, the, as much as I love that in this book too, there are, some, uh, there are some differences. And I think the one that jumps out at me time and time again as I'm, as I'm uh, reading and thinking about this is time. Uh, as an element, this book takes place in, in 1917 on the eve of America entering the First World War. Um, and you said last time you were here, I listened to the, uh, listened to the podcast of that, that you like writing what you know. Um, and as much as this is stuff that, that you know, you are in on, um, can you talk about the challenges related to writing about a time period in which, you know, you don't know as much? Um, when I first started the book, my idea was to, uh, I was going to write a historical novel. Uh, I live in Chillicothe, Ohio, and in 1917, when America entered the war, uh, the government built a huge army training camp called Camp Sherman on the edge of that town. Uh, and there was more people in the camp than there were in the city. It was, a, you know, it was a, a really big thing. And, um, so I was going to have the camp and, you know, I was going to bring in character soldiers from different parts of the country and that was going to be sort of the novel. And then one day the Jewett brothers appeared and after I worked on them a while, I decided, no, that's my story, these three brothers. Uh, but in the meantime, I had done a lot of reading about Camp Sherman and about, you know, America in the, you know, the first, 20 years of uh, uh, the 20th century. Uh, and then I just kind of forgot about all that stuff. You know, the thing is with 1917, it, if you take away the uh, electricity and the radio, that's pretty much how my grand, great grandparents lived. And, you know, I, I can remember how they lived. And so it wasn't really that hard for me to, you know, I had to figure out, you know, uh, as far as like what years the technology was happening, you know, the phone and the automobile and stuff like that. But, but as far as just, you know, like there's a farmer and his wife in the book, the fiddlers, and I could have imagined, you know, what their life uh, or lives was, was like uh, without doing any research. Um, I think it's interesting and I, I I think you put it the same way uh, when we were chatting backstage. The the uh, the Jewett brothers appeared, um, so it's three brothers: the charismatic older one, the rebel <laughs> middle one, and and uh, sweet natured but simple, strong uh, third brother. And they're all such incredible characters. Was there historical precedent? Uh, for how did they appear to you? I guess is the. Is the um, <clears throat> it is. I find it impossible to, uh, I guess, describe the creative process or whatever. And I was just, you know, I just go out there to the shed and I work and, you know, I was typing and the first thing that came to me was their last name. And then, and actually their father appeared before they did, Pearl. So then Pearl, you know, okay, what about Pearl? And he's got three sons and then, you know, it just goes from there. Um, but there wasn't any, you know, like a, like a model, I okay. guess, for. Um, one thing that I found really interesting about this book and, and your work in general is uh, the span of time and how characters, you know, whether it takes uh, uh, decades, really, for, for characters to come together, um, they come together eventually. And I noticed that progressively through the books, this one takes place in a, in a relatively shorter amount of time, the main narrative that we're looking back, excluding flashbacks and that kind of thing. Um, and 
on that note, there are so many balls in the air here. There are so many characters. Did you find it difficult in this one to make all of these people converge and smash into each other and bounce <laughs> off each other and interact in, in this shorter time frame? Um, well, that was probably the hardest thing to do was to, you know, um, and I sort of used the model of my, this, my first novel, you know, and I was like, okay, that one worked fairly well. I mean, there were some things I could have done better, but uh, I just wanted to introduce all these characters and then have them collide towards the end. Uh, and it was extremely hard to figure out how to do that and make it, you know, um, sort of natural, you right. know, that, okay, it makes sense, it, you know, that they might meet. Um, but yeah, it was, well, besides just writing the story itself, that was uh, the next hardest thing to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, that's always the tough part, <laughs> yeah, writing it yeah, down. Unfortunately, has got a great idea. <laughs> um, I liked this so much too because I never f exactly feel like I'm reading a, a an historical novel, and that nothing feels. I, I don't feel like I'm getting anachronistic speech, or you know, overly described. What I mean, I feel like I'm there, but it never it never feels weighed down by it being you know a hundred years ago, and and everything seems very familiar in that way. And it gave me the sense of history repeating itself. And you know, we have we have visited this area um, in the last books that you know, in the other in your other work. Mm -hmm. And I, was that part of it for you? Is going back and kind of saying the more things change, you know? Um, well, you know, there is uh, a lot of our. It seems like, especially now, you know, right now, the way where America is you know, embroiled in all these different problems. It seems like, you know, we progress a lot, you know, say with technology and stuff, you know, like that. Um, medicine, whatever, scientific stuff. But in a lot of ways we stay the same, you know, that we were, you know, same way we were 100 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. there are wars and racism and violence and on and on and maybe probably even more violence now than there was a hundred years ago I'm sure um, so yeah, yeah things do stay the same um, in a lot of ways well I also was thinking about that it you know this takes place on as we were talking about on the cusp of World War one and and um, there are just these amazing phrases in here about it and I, I kind of feel like you're talking about modernity and today and that kind of thing that uh, the world is infected with progress, one character says. And it's what people call modern times. And another character says, in 100 years, everything we, we deem worthwhile won't be, paraphrasing, won't be considered <laughs> important. Um, and everything will be looked on as equal even when it's not. And it, it's sort of, I hate to make everything about political elections <laughs> and that kind of thing, but it feels like that at some points. Is that a conscious thing in, in, in your writing? Um, I don't think that it's a conscious thing. I don't, you know, I, I don't think I was trying to make a statement. I think what it comes from is that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a complete Luddite or anything like that, but I am not that, you know, I'm not that fascinated by technology. Right. I mean, as far as like, I'm not obsessed with it or, you know, in fact, I just bought my first cell phone in the spring. You know, I had gone all those years without a cell phone, and then finally my my agent kept kind of, you know, you really need to buy a cell phone, you know, so people can keep track of you. Um, and I I think it was that was more of a personal, you know, uh, view that just sort of comes out of me, a personal belief that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not knocking technology. I mean, I know that, you know, there's a lot of good things to be had from it, but there's also some bad things. Right. Um, well, just don't get words with friends. You'll lose <laughs> all productivity. Um, it, something I, I really love um, reading in general in literature is, is kind of the, the, I don't know, I guess Hamlet play within the play 
uh, sort of thing. And there's, there's a lot in here. Well, I mean, there is a, a person who loves Shakespeare who's reading <laughs> Richard III in this, actually. Um, but uh, a lot in here is the pa about the power of myth-making and storytelling. And, and, you know, as these three, um, yes, pretty violent uh, brothers are making their way across the quiet countryside, you know, and they are doing things, but it becomes mythologized to the point that, that you know, they're both necrophiliacs, but they're, they're great lovers and wonderful people, and, and different people <laughs> start believing different things about them. I was just wondering if you can kind of talk about the power of myth-making um, in your work, and sort of this, uh, is it in kind of this Gothic Southern tradition, or is it just something you enjoy writing in your work? No, I, I was, I have been, uh, you know, my biggest influence has been the Southern writers, you know, what they call the Southern Gothic, you know, tradition like Flannery O'Connor and Harry Cruz, people like that. Um, I don't know about the myth-making thing. I don't know if I can answer that question. You know, I just try to tell a story. And, but one of the things that I was trying to, you know, I was thinking about while I was doing this book was, you know, the brothers have this, they have a Bible, you know, they're extremely poor, as you can, from the reading that I did, you know, later they stay that way with, while they're with their father. They have a Bible and they have this old dime novel that they found in the trash called The Life and Times of Bloody Bill Bucket. And only one of the brothers can read and he reads out loud to them every night from this book for several years. And it's just this you know, trashy story about a a, um, a Confederate soldier who tur turns bank robber after the war. And so I was, I think I was trying to like, you know, it was, th these boys are almost without hope, but they have this book that sort of, you know, it helps them get through some rough years. And uh, I, I think I was thinking more of that than, you know, just the power of right. um, literature or, or books to, um, to help a, you get by in life. Um, I, I read in a Dayton newspaper that they're asking you about reading, and you, you just said, I wanted to tell a good yarn. I think Andy said that in the intro. Yeah, and that's... And it is, it is, such, it is such a great yarn. Um, and one thing that you do in it... Um, <coughs> that happens to lesser and larger degrees in your other work um, is uh, playing with narrative perspective. And it's both kind of godlike and intimate because we can see the world from a character's perspective and, and see how that person sees it. And then it'll jump to another person and how he sees that or she sees that other person. And the two things do not line up at all, <laughs> ever. And it, it feels, it's, it's intimate, but you feel very powerful knowing like, oh no, he, he killed the guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, this seems to be your most nuanced um, story in that way to date. Um, I, can you talk about how th this seems really difficult to write? It seems really challenging and fun. Um, uh, do you ever find yourself having to like cut it off? You know, having to just stop? You know, getting into people's backstories because, as interesting as they are, it starts taking up too oh much yeah, time. Oh yeah, sure. It uh, you know, and that's the big danger with um, writing a book like that. You know, where you've got all these different points of view uh, is because there's a you know there's a, a big chance you're going to confuse the reader for one thing and or bore them. So you have to know you know how much is enough. You know, and then. You know, I, I throw away a lot of pages <laughs> uh, when I'm working on a book. I'm a very messy writer, messy. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Um, but the, you know, the thing about that with just, you know, if a person just appears for a, a brief time, you know, maybe it's a, somebody, a storekeeper or whatever, you know, I, I've always sort of thought of it this way, is like if I go to the, you know, if I go to the grocery store, um, and, and everybody knows this, if I go to the grocery store, well, the clerk's got a story, the person behind me in line's got a story, everybody's got a story, you know? I mean, they're not just, 
you know, they're not just there to, to fill up my day or, you know, or in the case of a book, you know, to, just to fill in the blanks. Uh, they've got a story. So I try to do that as much as I can. And I do have a lot of fun with that. I, right. Yeah. Um, is this something you've always done, just kind of uh, no, seeing I, the mailman and thinking about who he has <laughs> chained up in the basement? Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know if I've always done it as much as I do now, you know. I, one thing I learned early on when I was trying to, and it probably had always been like this, uh, but when I was learning, say, to try to write short stories or whatever, you have to pay attention if you're going to be a writer. You know, you got to pay attention, you know, as much as you can anyway. Yeah. Uh, and some of that seeps in and a lot of it's lost, but, yeah. And so funny sometimes, and I, 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 I find these characters that I'm really drawn to. I get to like two pages and then they're just, and they're worthwhile and they're important to the narrative, but they're just gone. Yeah. Like you get, you get this <laughs> this brief look at the guy who writes the life and times of Bloody Bill Bucket, and he's he's just this horrible failure living in you know a, a roach infested place in Brooklyn, and um, I don't know. I think that's always a good sign when people want this more. <laughs> and by the way, from the NPR review, lest you think this isn't humorous, uh, it says the Heavenly Table feels like Blood Meridian if Cormac McCarthy had been born with a streak of black humor in him rather than just terseness and rage. And I love that. <laughs> and, and in a way that I think a, a lot of writers could say it about McCarthy as much as I love him, you love these characters. And oh, yes. even, the, even, the, even the bad ones. Um, is, it, is it tough to put them through such ringers, <laughs> uh, both emotional and very, very physical? Well, um you, you know, there was one or two, you know, in all of my books, you know, well, I've only got three, but, uh, <laughs> you know, most people come to a bad end, but uh, not all of them in this one. And um, and there were a couple that I, you know, I, I kind of felt sad, you know, that I was going to have to do this to them, you know, but... Um, but I do, you know, I think that if you're going to spend, you know, I write about these people so much, I spend so much time with them. I'm calling them people, but characters. Uh, yeah, you, I, I have a, an affinity for these uh, people. And, and, you know, if I didn't have, it would be extremely hard for me to spend as much time as I do with them. Um, you address some themes here that, uh, and, and, I find myself often drawn to how you're looking at class and you know s sort of these institutions that, that we put so much faith in, literally, or not literally, but, but like the church uh, or law enforcement kind of let us down. Um, but y you, address, you address some themes of race in this that I think are important. I love the character of Sugar. There's a man named Sugar. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about him in particular as being one of these characters that, that you've written. He's so unsavory in a lot of ways, uh, but I don't know. Um, let's see. I really, you know, I, I can't even remember how Sugar came into the, you know, he came into the story because he was walking along the road uh, and he meets Ellsworth Fiddler, the farmer, and then I you know, later on I started, it was like I, I couldn't let go of him. So I, you know, brought him back in and stuff like that. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you have to figure, and there's, a, you know, there's a, some racism in my book. There's, a, you know, the N-word, stuff like that. But it is 1917, and, you know, it, it, it was just uh, sort of the way that, well, even when I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, you know, in Knock'em Stiff, it was how people talked. It was, you know, sort of the what they thought, uh, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, it wasn't that I was trying to, you know, say something about race or right. anything like that. It was just that he was a character and he happened to be black. Um, yeah. Well, you, you play with these things a lot, and, you know, I, 
I'm reading this and I'm thinking about the interview and, I, and I'm, I, I'm like, is this a book about morality? But everyone's really compromised in certain ways. Um, there's a character of an, uh, a sanitation inspector. He inspects outhouses that seems to be the most sweet-hearted in certain ways and everyone just dumps on him and, and uh, not giving any spoilers, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> not giving any spoilers for the book, but uh, I just, I think about morality in this a lot. Um, is there any sort of commentary on morality or, or uh, I think especially as it pertains to us, institutional brutality and, and, and that kind of thing uh, that you were trying to address in this book particularly? That's a tough question. Uh, yeah, it is a <laughs> tough question. Um, no, I, I, not that, you know, I, I have to go back to the, you know, which is my old standby when I can't answer a question, is <laughs> that I'm really, I'm just trying to write a story, you know, and, that, and somehow, you know, after so much work, a lot of work, you know, there's the story. I'm not ever thinking about the reader or what other people might think of the book when I'm working on it. I, not at all. I mean, um, that would block me. Right. You know, and uh, maybe block me in good ways. I don't know. It, it, you know, uh, I, I get pretty drastic at times with some of this stuff. But, um, you know, for example, though, going back to that other question about, say, you know, class and, and all that stuff, you know, I grew up in this little place, uh, almost everybody was dirt poor. Fortunately, I wasn't. I, my father had a pretty good job. He worked at the paper mill. But, you know, you're Southern Ohio hillbilly, you know, and, you know, the bankers and uh, the big shots and, uh, you know, you, you kind of, you know, that's all, they, they look down on you and, you know, and for, that's where that comes from, I guess. You know, that just remembering that sort of, um, that viewpoint that a lot of people that I grew up with had. That if you had a little bit of money, well then you were, you know, there were, you, you were uh, totally different than them. Right, uh, a necessarily adversarial stance yeah. kind of thing. Okay, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that's what makes me keep thinking about these books is that you know, some people are moral, some are not, and you're right, it's a great yarn, and some people get what they deserve, and some people just keep on doing bad. And, uh, <laughs> Hello. Uh, hey. Coming from a working-class, blue-collar background, do you find yourself at all at odds with the literary world that you now move through? Um... Well, no, not really. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, you know, the only time that I um, really, I mean, even meet other writers is when I'm out doing stuff like this, for the most part. I mean, you know, I still live in uh, Ross County, Ohio. I've lived there all my life uh, in a small town. And um, somebody asked me in an, in an interview, uh, a while back, well, you know, why, after you published a couple of books, why didn't you, did you have, you know, move to a big city, go to New York or something like that? And, uh, well, for one thing, there was no way I'd ever do that. You know, I, it's too crowded, too many people, too expensive, you know. Um, and, you know, if you're a writer, you really need to go somewhere where the, it's cheap to live. <laughs> um, but with that said, you know, I have a lot of friends who are writers that I email with, that I, you know, meet at festivals, stuff like that. But, but that's about all of it that I want, you know. Uh, I don't think I'd want to live in a, you know, around a group of writers all the time. We're a little bit too crazy for, you know, to be around each other all the time. Uh, and then you wouldn't get any work done, too. Uh, you'd just be, so, yeah, that's... You mentioned the Southern Gothic tradition, and I wondered if you could define or describe that, how you see that, and also how you 
what you think about where that came from, how that evolved. Well, I look upon the, like, what I think of as Southern Gothic is a sort of a combination of uh, religion, place, violence, um, and I, the earliest, I guess, book, novel that, that I'm familiar with that maybe started that whole thing was uh, Faulkner's Sanctuary. Um, you know, and I'm not calling, I don't think, you know, a lot of his stuff isn't, you know, Southern Gothic. Well, Rose for Emily or Miss Emily or whatever the title of that story was. That, that was probably actually the first sort of gothic southern thing I ever read. Um, but I, um, you know, when I was learning, trying to learn how to write short stories, I typed stories out, and I typed out probably a dozen Flannery O'Connor stories. And, um, you know, chapters from Harry Cruz novels, stuff like that. So, but yeah, that's how I think of it, you know, sort of a combination of the violence and the place, and, you know, they deal a lot with place and, uh, and the lower classes. What the atmosphere in Knockham Stiff was like, uh, or how it was affected by the publication of your first book, uh, in the months following it, when it garnered quite a bit of attention, did yeah. that anything exciting happen in Knockham Stiff after that? Um, well, I, I think probably some people know that someone stole the sign. Uh, about you know, right around the time the book was published, and uh, then the township said hey, we've replaced that thing like five or six times, we're not going to do it anymore. So, um, uh, you, there, not a lot. You know, there were, you know, there were a lot of people from around that area that bought the book. Um, I think some of them bought it thinking that it was this sort of like I'd written a memoir about growing up there or something. and. Uh, they were sadly disappointed when they started reading those stories. Um, but I also think that a lot of them were a little bit proud that, you know, the, the cover of the book has the original sign. Uh, and so, you know, there's this book titled Knock 'em Stiff, and it's where they live, and, you know, it doesn't get that much attention, you know. So it's, um, it, it, it was something that, for them to get a kick out of. Um, you have to understand, though, that Knock'em Stiff is nothing like the place that I grew up in. It, it's like a lot of little communities like that that sort of were sucked dry, you know, in the 70s and the 80s and, and the 90s uh, by, you know, just people moving out and the big box stores being in town, everything cheaper in town, and everybody had a car, that sort of thing. So there were, when I was growing up there, there were about four or 500 people lived in Knock'em Stiff. There were three stores and a bar and a church. And now the only thing left is uh, the church. And most of the people, and I knew everybody there when I was growing up, everyone. I knew the history of their family. I, I knew everything about them. And now I can go out there and except for, you know, my parents are still alive. They still live there. I have a brother and a sister that live close by. Uh, but I can go out there and I don't know anybody. You know, it's all of the old people have either died or the, you know, people have moved off and then, uh, you know, people then have come in who live in Chillicothe and have bought tracts of land and built houses, stuff like that. So I'm really writing about a ghost town. Did anybody think that uh, they were being written about in that book? You know, I've had people that I met in cities in other states that, whom I had never seen before in my life who thought that I had based a character on them. Uh, so it's, yeah, you've always got people who, well, that sounds, you know, that I know who that is, you know, that right. sort of thing. 
Uh, but I was very careful about that. I, uh, you know, I would take, you know, certain details or characteristics from, you know, things that I'd seen, people I'd met. But, uh, you know, I just kind of meshed them all together. I, uh, well, for one thing, I didn't want to get, you know, sued or anything like that. But uh, I didn't want to offend anybody either. Just a kind of craft question, just transitioning from writing shorter pieces to a novel. Like, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was extremely hard. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, like I said, when I started out, I thought I, I might be able to write short stories. I could never write a novel. And um, so that's that was sort of like, you know, the first... Uh, about five years, that's what I worked on, trying to learn how to write short stories. I never thought anything about writing something longer. Uh, but then when um, Doubleday bought the collection of stories, the first question after that was, do you have a novel? Do you have an idea for a novel? And I said, yes, I do. Um, and, and in a way, I did. I thought, well, okay, since they bought the book, you know, of course, that's just the natural progression of things. You know, you, you write a novel then. Uh, but it was really hard for me to figure out how to do that. And, as, you know, the devil all the time is sort of divided up into these sections. And some of those chapters could almost be short stories. And that's how I did it, you know, that, um, but now that I've, you know, now I've done two, and I, I don't know if I'd go back to short stories now. I, I, you know, I like being able to spend a lot more time with, you know, some of the, some of the characters I come up with. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Oh, you mentioned that it, took you around five years of writing short stories to hone your skill in that. While you were writing them, what kind of feedback did you get and from whom did you get it? Um, well, the only feedback that I was getting were, were pretty much were rejection slips. Um, I didn't show my work to anybody else, you know, but I did send it out. You know, I, I was like the, I used the shotgun method. So if I finished a story, I would maybe mail it out to 10 different magazines. And then once I got about five or six rejections back, I would mail out five or six more copies of that story. And, uh, you know, once in a while I'd get some comments, or once in a while I'd get lucky and they'd publish one, somebody would. Uh, but I was, uh, you yeah, know, that was one of the reasons that I finally quit my job and went to an MFA program was because I was, you know, I'd never been around any writers. And I, you know, by that time I had been working at it long enough that I knew it's what I wanted to do, and I knew that I had to get away from the paper mail and get around some people who were, you know, interested in the same thing I was. I needed some feedback. Um, but yeah, that first five years, I was just on my own. The shotgun method, very, very yeah. appropriate. This is the third craft question in a row. There was something that you said a moment ago or before the, 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 the woman up front started mm -hmm. this craft dialogue or portion of it. And I thought I heard you say that at the very beginning, when you were just learning your craft or developing it, that you typed out stories, Flannery O'Connor stories, as for instance, uh, Harry Cruz. And what I couldn't understand is, did you mean that you just literally typed their story to see what it felt like coming off of your fingers and typing it out, or stories in the spirit of those two writers? No. I type their stories out on an IBM typewriter. Um, and I did, uh, well, how it came about was I had been flailing around just on my own um, for about a year and a half. And I wasn't making much progress. 
And then I read this interview, and I cannot for the life of me remember the lady's name. This was not an original idea of mine. I read an interview, and this lady said, well, once in a while I type out somebody's stuff, you know, some other writer's stuff, just to, you know, and it helps me. And I thought, I could do that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I did. I, I typed out, I chose a short story every week, one that I liked, and one that wasn't too long, and I typed it out, and then I carried it around with me for uh, three or four or five days, and I kept looking at it. And so I, I typed out stories by John Cheever, Richard Yates, Hemingway, Flannery O'Connor. I typed out every story in Jesus' Son by Dennis Johnson, uh, but it was once a week, one a week, and I did about uh, 75 of them. And I learned more from doing that than anything else I've ever done about writing. And I think part of it was, I am not a close reader. You know, I'm, um, I'm just not, I'm just not a good reader. And, and, but there was something about typing the story out that, you know, I could have read that story five, six, seven times. But until I typed it out, I couldn't really get, say, like how somebody did dialogue or how they made the transitions in the story or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, so I had been doing that maybe, oh, you know, I did it for about a year and a half, probably uh, six months or so, and I, and I, and I published a story. You know, so um, it did help me a lot. I, I mean, it's not for everybody, but uh, it, it was uh, extremely helpful for me. Uh, hi. I just wondered um, if you, first, if you missed the paper mill at all, and how you feel that the paper, working in the paper mill for those years um, sort of informs your writing, you know, how the people that you met there, the people that you worked with, what the environment was like. Does that come through in your, sure, inspire I mean, your stories at all? Well, you know, I worked at that paper mill for 32 years, uh, from the time I was 18 until I was 50. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, well, it, it, it took up the biggest part of my life. Um, I won't say that I wish I was back at the mill, but, you know, writing is a very precarious op occupation. It's, for me, it's always been, it's sort of like feast or famine. And with the paper mill, I had a check every week coming in, and it was union wages. I, I, it was a good, great job. Uh, I had a pension plan. I had health insurance, and uh, and I don't have any of that now. Um, so there's that. And then I also had uh, almost all of my friends worked at the paper mill. And uh, since I've left, I left in 2005. A lot of those guys I don't see anymore. You know, we're just kind of lost touch. Uh, I think probably the, as far as like when it comes down to writing stuff, you know, to the, I think the biggest thing that I got from the mill was uh, sort of like a, a feeling for, I'm going to call it black humor, because I worked with guys who could joke about anything. I mean, somebody's grandmother dies, and they're telling a joke about it, you know, that sort of stuff. And, and I, you know, and some of them were hilarious. I mean, some of these guys were, uh, they, they should have been on stage probably, but uh, that's probably the biggest thing I got from it. That and, uh, well, maybe the, maybe the, um, I find it, um, you know, with a lot of writers, the biggest problem is the uh, 
getting together the discipline to go to the shed or wherever and sit down and stay there. And, uh, and I think, you know, by work punching a clock all those years, you know, it kind of got me used to that thing. I'm not to say that I'm, I am lazy. I'm, um, but when I get started, I can stick with it. And I, you know, and the, you know, I worked a lot of overtime there. I, uh, so, you know, I was used to working all the time and it's definitely easier, you know, sitting at a desk typing than it was doing the job that I did. So right. when I'm writing, uh, I get up about 6.30. I work in a shed that was, uh, when my wife and I bought this house, it was, a, it was an old shed that the guy kept his lawnmowers in and stuff. I converted it into an office. I smoke, so I can't work in the house. Uh, my wife won't allow that. So I go out to the shed about 7, and I work till about somewhere between 11 and 12. And then I walk my dog, I eat lunch, I try to forget all about the writing. Uh, after I leave the shed. So, but I've got two different schedules. I've got that schedule, and then later on, when I'm deep into the book, uh, a lot of times I will switch to nights because I feel that I'm a little bit more creative and I can go longer. So once I get into that stage, I'll maybe go out to the shed at 9 o'clock and work till 4, something like that. But but I don't like to live that sort of a uh, schedule all the time. I think probably roughly half of us knew we couldn't do it when he said getting up at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> um, everybody, won't you join me in thanking Donald Ray Pollock? It's been great. Thank you.